Thank you. Um, so welcome everyone. Thank you for those of you that come down in person and those of you who've joined online. Um, today we're going to present to you some of the work we've been kind of doing over the last couple of years, uh, nearly three years um, now, um, between ourselves and the AI Centre. Um, and really we're going to kind of zoom in on what we've learned during that process and, you know, ultimately how we can make clinical AI scale out across the NHS. Um, as you will see as we go through, there's some barriers to that and certainly, you know, some ideas we've got for how to address that. Um, just to say, um, if you're online, we are looking to, oh, hang on, <laughs> the window, we're looking to take questions on Slido. Um, so if you want to use the QR code, that will take you to where you can submit questions, um, or you can use the number on the left-hand side, if you want to kind of log in. Um, and just kind of find the right room to do that. And then we'll, if we've got time, come back and do some questions at the end. So who am I? Um, I'm Michael Measures. I'm the Director of Technology for Answer Digital. Um, we have uh, Matt with us today, Matt Allinson from the AI Centre, um, who has basically been their engagement manager during the, the delivery. And we've got uh, Joe Bat over, over there as well, who is our QA architect, who will be doing a demo of the, some of the software we've developed over the last couple of years with the AI Center, which I'll tell you a bit more about as we go through. So what are we going to cover today? So today really it's a it's a bit of a hopefully take you on a journey where we explain a bit of the background of what we've been doing. Um, you know, why there's an imperative to use AI in clinical radiology, um, how we can best overcome some of those barriers that are stopping that happening or have been stopping that happening over the last kind of five years or so. And then we'll do some real world examples. So Matt will take us through some of the work they, they've been doing in terms of AI applications that are out there and are starting to be used. And then like I said, we'll do a demo and a Q&A at the end. Um, just very briefly, so Ants Digital here in Leeds, obviously we've been here for about 20 years, believe it or not. Um, we do lots of work in healthcare, um, some in wealth management and retail, and we do end-to-end Kind of delivery services as a digital consultancy, uh, everything from user experience at the beginning all the way through to kind of live service and uh, at the other end with a, a big kind of meeting and sandwich being technical delivery. And it was in that capacity for the last three years we've been working with the London AI Centre. Um, so, you know, we've brought, if you like, our technical skills to the equation and the AI Centre, which is a consortium of trusts and research institutions, brought their kind of uh, product vision and expertise in kind of actually putting AI into clinical workflows and then also kind of new academic research in terms of like evidence for new models. So where did it all start? Well, we three years ago, we started out on a journey based around the Office of Life Science and DHSC grant, uh, which was 16 million pounds, which basically set up the AI Center. And a portion of that was put into the development to uh, new AI products, um, one of which is called AID, which is the one we're focusing on today, which is around AI deployment. It's the AI deployment engine. And we think that helps address some of the barriers that we'll go through a bit later on. Um, if you're doing AI research, that's a kind of different problem, more around how you do that in a way that is privacy preserving and doesn't mean you've got to form like a massive data lake to train your models. We have got another talk coming up in a couple of days which kind of looks under the hood of FLIP, which is the Federated Learning Interoperability Platform, which is designed to solve that particular problem. So if you're interested in federated learning and training AI models, then I encourage you to go to the session in a couple of days. Um, but today we're going to talk about AID, which is about getting stuff into clinical use. Is it tomorrow? tomorrow. Thanks, Jay. Sorry. <laughs> Women in Tech on Wednesday. Yeah. 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 Um, so I mentioned the partnership. So the AI Centre is kind of unique in as much as um, what we have is um, a consortium of 10 NHS trusts um, and four academic institutions um, that basically work alongside them um, in, in order to deliver um, aid um, in, in collaboration with some industry partners. So, you know, very much um, cutting edge research being done and you know multidisciplinary uh, which i think is the first unwritten barrier is it's you know quite hard sometimes to get the technology people in the room as well as the clinical people as well as the governance people in a way that's productive certainly in the nhs at the moment with the kind of pressures that you will have seen 
you know, not everyone always has the headspace to do these. So even though um, there might be um, a, a kind of a general willingness, you know, carving out enough time of a multidisciplinary team to actually do something like this is not is not a given. Oh, and I should say, actually, just before I move on, so um, Harris, um, who uh, basically worked with the AI Centre, he, he's really been the product owner for a throughout the delivery. Um, and really, it was his vision kind of three years ago that kicked off this uh, this journey that we've been on together. So I guess first off, I just thought I'd set the scene about why why do we want to get AI into clinical workflows in the first place? What's the, what's the point? Um, now, Aid as a product has been designed initially for clinical radiology AI deployment. Um, and so, you know, that's got its own challenges. But year on year, what we're seeing is kind of increased demand for radiology. I think it's something like 8% of uh, hospital admissions involve some kind of diagnostic radiology test at the front end. And the demand on the system is going up um, at least 5% a year for things like CT and MRI. And that's happening year on year on year, and some of the, um, the the way that those have to be interpreted, you know, is is obviously getting more involved as well if you use it for intervention purposes. So, you know, there is this kind of growing demand within the system, and what we're seeing is that the workforce isn't growing at the same rate, and it isn't able to keep up with that kind of increased demand. Um, and that's been recognised, you know, really for at least the last you know, five years that I know about. So it's not a new problem. It's just one that's kind of compounding and getting getting worse as we go forward. Um, so the Royal College of Radiographers, um, radiologists, they um, they do a, a sense of their workforce every year. And at the moment, uh, we're sitting at about a 30% shortfall of people in that profession to actually do the work that needs to be done. And that situation is expected to get worse and be, you know, 40% shortfall by 2027. So, you know, what we see is AI, if you can get it into these clinical workflows, really has the potential to help. So at the moment, patients are experiencing, experiencing sorry, longer, longer wait times, effectively growing waiting lists and potentially are not getting, you know, the results reported as expediently as they could, which again can lead to kind of delays in um, being able to treat the condition if they have a condition. So, you know, it's really it's really important that we do look at kind of dual track approach to fixing this, you know, adding more people, training more people, definitely part of it, but also can AI have a role? And we think it can. And um, I think one of the one of the uh, ones that really shocked me was the one where it says 48% on the slide. And it's basically of the radiology consultants that were surveyed only 48% felt they could actually deliver 24 seven service um, as needed. So again, you know, maybe I can help at those kind of edges where it's not your, you know, your kind of main um, nine to five, but maybe it's in, in an A&E department on a, you know, early hours on a Saturday night, you know, there might be opportunities for AI to augment those work. Um, and like I say, the potential solution is to put AI into the system. And, you know, that can help either make existing tasks faster, which you'll see a few examples of later. It can also make things more accurate or less costly to do. Um, and it can also make things more repeatable. So there's a whole range of benefits here if you can unlock the deployment and kind of running aspects of it. And just say IH is the Integrating Healthcare Enterprise. I have to look that up because when I Googled it, it said the Institute of Highway Engineers. And I thought, no, that's not the right, not the right reference. <laughs> so, um, but they're a body that basically set some of the data standards around um, how computer systems in healthcare communicate. Um, so, you know, so not a new idea. Um, and, and what we have indeed seen is, you know, over the last kind of five years, the number of marked AI products that are ready to go into clinical use has been rising year on year. So there's now 223 and counting um, AI models that have been approved for clinical use. And those models have to be CE marked to do that. Um, but the, you know, one of the problems is that those models are generally quite narrowly focused. And so in order to actually cover a large range of different um, diagnostic or modalities, um, you need a lot of them to actually cover, you know, to cover the base. So they might be looking for something very specific. Um, so, so, 
you know, so whilst you can kind of see AI is being adopted in pockets, I guess what we're finding is that for, for NHS trusts anyway, it's quite hard for them to find the resources to actually commission, install and configure and manage in an ongoing basis, all these kind of point solutions that are out there at the moment. So the, you know, the first barrier, um, as we see it, is very much around in order to cover the gamut of modalities and conditions is that you're going to need a lot of AI models in your clinical workflow to make an impact. And, you know, that could be hundreds or thousands potentially at, at really at scale. And doing it the way that we're doing it today is really just going to lead to a jungle of AI models that are bespoke procured, bespoke uh, configured into other systems and potentially, you know, hard to manage and hard to maintain over time. So why we might get some kind of early benefit from them. If we're not careful, we're going to cr create a bit of a mess really out there in the ecosystem. The uh, second second uh, kind of barrier to entry is around interoperability. Um, so those of you that are familiar with healthcare, you know, you you might have heard of data standards like DICOM or FHIR or HL7, which kind of do help with communication between computer systems, but uh, and, and it's in fact one of the reasons that clinical radiology has been quite successful in adopting AI is that the DICOM standard has been around for a long time and is quite mature. Um, but it's still each system within within hospitals, you know, it's not a standardized PAX system like a picture archiving system. Each hospital trust might have its own uh, different version from a different manufacturer. And each time you go to put an AI model in, obviously you need good data in to get to get the right quality of findings out. Um, so at the moment, you know, again, doing this because of the bottleneck in the IT departments and because of the amount of bespoke work involved, this hampers the adoption of AI into the NHS. And then the third one is really just driven by um, a lack of evidence for some models. So you quite often have um, enthusiastic small startups at the moment that might have a model they've trained on you know, on a particular, for a particular finding or a particular diagnostic result, but it, it, it might have been trained on a data set that's not directly applicable to the use case that it's, it's being put into the hospital for. So there's a need to kind of almost like steward that into proper production and make sure there is a degree of evidence gathering actually at the point of deployment and, and procurement. Um, so, you know, really you need a platform that's been designed from the ground up to support this kind of interim step. So, you know, you, you don't go straight from kind of picking a model off the shelf to full scale rollout. You might want to do some, some pilot studies or trials of that within your clinical setting for your particular patients before you're happy to, to allow that out into the wild. And, you know, again, there's no real um, mature support for that in the ecosystem at the moment. So I've kind of mentioned aid a couple of times, and like I say, we seem to we've we've been working on building this with the AI Center for the last um, like I say two and a half three years, and really this this platform is designed to standardize th uh, things like the deployment of AI models, the integration to third party systems, and to make it much easier to manage at scale um, a number of AI models running concurrently within your your healthcare setting. And it, it kind of does that by being a common runtime underneath the healthcare system. So it's around making like the infrastructure smarter within the hospitals. And, you know, once we've integrated once to those um, clinical systems, it's kind of like the same as Java was if you knew like you know, 20 years ago, it was kind of right once run many times. Um, you can run a whole plethora of models. Um, so you can see on the right hand side of the picture, there's things like, um, you know, brain tumor detection prostate surveillance, um, you know, COVID chest x-ray checking, you know, there's a whole heap of different models that address those different point things. But what we've done is create a standardized platform on which they can run. And if you're interested, you can follow the link or the QR code and read the documentation for aid that's on, on GitHub. Um, and like I say, really, it's around putting the right underpinnings in so that we don't accrue all this kind of debt going forward. So aid is live as, as, as we stand today. It's Fully, fully built, been rolled out across six NHS trusts and further two more coming. So it covers about 15 million people in total. And it's been built very much, you know, with clinicians right from the get go. And one of the really 
kind of things I'm proud of is as well, it's been built on open source technologies from the ground up. So this is not like a, a vendor lock-in situation. This is something that you can you can run with this and use it without the fear of vendor lock-in, which again is another downside of you know, what we're seeing in the market at the moment is that every, well, not every, but a lot of uh, AI models, you know, you have to put in a particular piece of kit to run their model as well. So you end up with a degree of vendor lock-in. So like I say, it's open source. Um, if you're familiar with um, Monai, um, then obviously, you know, there's, a, there's other parts of that, but the, the bit that we've been working on is Monai Deploy. So as a company, we've been contributing to the open source uh, community around Monai uh, in partnership with NVIDIA. So it's, it's an NVIDIA backed community, open source. Um, and really um, underneath the hood in aid, you, we've got three components. One is how to integrate, which is the MIG, which is the Monai informa Informatics Gateway. Then we've got the um, the kind of runtime, the Monai Deploy and Monai Workflow. And then we've also got the kind of where you package your AI in a standardized way. So those three pieces together help address the barriers that we talked about earlier and enable you to, to basically reach a position where you can now effectively deploy out AI models um, in a standardized package format across your estate and monitor them and run them um, in, and see the results of that in real time. So, you know, a much more mature position than we were before. The um, aid itself is let's say, a collection of user interfaces and other components around those kind of core open source components. Uh, it, like you can see, if we just take the, the picture from left to right, um, it plugs into your packs and your different modalities done as within your hospital, whether that's CT or MRI or other other systems. Um, and it, the orchestrator really is the heart, the beating heart of aid. Um, but the the other bits are just as important. So the app store element of aid is where, as an, a model developer, you can upload your package model into an app store just like you would on your smartphone for for Apple or Android. You know, you can package it up, you can provide the documentation, upload it into the app store, and then the administrators within the different trusts can decide what, what they want to pull down into their own trust. Um, and even, you know, if the administrator wants to, they could delegate the rights to, you know, key clinicians even. So it's a self-serve model uh, based around an app store and an administrative interface. And then we have the clinical review element, which allows you to gain that evidence that we talked about earlier. So run models and gain performance statistics. And this one, you can just see the same thing, but basically with the Monai component tree called out um, and really just stressing again that it's, this is based on open source technology and this vendor. So with, with aid in your trust, what you're able to do is basically configure workflows um, that take medical data in on the left hand side. And then there's a number of standard kind of building blocks you can put together. Um, so here's a very simple illustration of where we've wired up a DICOM data source to aid. Um, when the data comes in, it inspects the metadata in that in that DICOM image. And if it's the right sort, so if it's like a chest X-ray or a or a head, you know, MRI of the, the brain, um, it will spin up the, an AI model based on the, those criteria that you've set up. And then the findings then are available to be exported either back straight back to the clinical system as in the bottom line, or if you want it through clinical review for evidence gener generation through the top line. Um, and, you know, those those workflows can be as complicated or as simple as you want. But, you know, in the in the simplest model, you just literally install the, the app in, set up the metadata and you're away. So, you know, very, very easy to do. Um, I mentioned that the, the previous slide was was running the models locally within your trust. If you've got the hardware to do that, um, not all trusts do. Some have um, a desire to run more kind of remote workloads on the cloud. So Aid also has the ability to do a remote execution of AI models, which some vendors and um, that's the preferred way to do it. Um, but in order to do that, you need to pseudo anonymize the data before you can send it out of the trust to the AI vendor to have the AI model executed. <laughs> and then rehydrate that PII data on the way back in. So that's what this one shows is that, you know, you have that ability to basically run AI models either on-premise, externally, remotely in the cloud, for example, 
and we're working on actually new parts of aid which might allow us to even do it at the edge do it kind of actually on the modalities as well um, but that's that's further out and still in development <laughs> so so with aid you, you're basically able to address the integration and deployment issues um and you know really out of the box what you get is a turnkey platform so the trust in the eye sense those 10 trusts have put some physical infrastructure into their environments to be able to support aid running um, that's what you see on the right hand side of the slide uh, so that's uh, an aid only stack um, we have a slightly fatter stack for uh, if you're running flip which i mentioned earlier as well which is for model training but this is kind of the minimum you need to run on premise uh, and it includes um hardware from nvidia with the right gpus to do that um and then the software is obviously installed over the top now you know this like i said this is the on-prem version which is the preference of some trusts um if you wanted to uh, and you want to do the remote execution um, you don't need to necessarily have the hardware on site. You can just do that through a kind of orchestration, so a much lighter weight uh, deployment than uh, than this one. Um, we, we are currently managing the kind of deployments and the upkeep of the aid system. So really, it's around taking some of the burden away from the on-site IT team so that, you know, you don't really need to, it's a managed solution. You don't need to worry about, um, you know, keeping it patched and up to date. We will do that for you. Um, and we also kind of manage the uh, monitoring and alerting of any issues and then have a help desk as well if there's any any kind of issues that needs to be brought up. So it's really around making it as absolutely as easy as possible to get those AI models into the clinical pathways. So that's where the value is. The value isn't in the platform, really. You know, the value is in actually the deployment of those models at scale. So, you know, we when we started this journey, and we did the first trusts with the deployment of aid um it, it's it would take months and you know we have heard of um, situations where different people have been trying to get hardware and software into trust that's taken years so um you know from where we were two and a bit years ago to now um we can deploy out an aid and we've done all the due diligence we've done like the VTAC and your uh, slsp and your uh, cd DCB 129, which is like your clinical safety case. So what we can actually do is now provide that package of uh, documentation to a trust um, to bootstrap the process of getting a, a system into their environment. And we can be up and running really in a matter of a couple of weeks. You know? So it's kind of days rather than, than weeks or months. Um, and you know we've now done that reproducibly across 10, you know, 10 NHS trusts. So um, it's a tried and proven kind of path now um, and like I say, if you don't want to have the on-prem hardware, that's again kind of simplifies it even somewhat even more. So, you know, theoretically we're getting to the point where, you know, if you've if you've got a trust with a mature cloud strategy, you could deploy a down, you know, in a matter of a few hours or a day or two, as long as you've gone through all the kind of sign off sign off hoops. So, you know, very rapid deployment, um, enabling those AI models to be deployed out and wired in, you know, very, very quickly. Um, so this is the front end, and you'll see more of this when Joe comes on and does his um, presentation. He's going to do the demo of, of kind of the different steps of what you can do with aid. But I just wanted to give you a kind of teaser trailer that, you know, really, as far as the end user is concerned, it's as simple as browsing onto this interface, picking the model you want to try and saying, right, pull that down into my trust. And now, you know, now it's in my clinical workflow. So you know, really trying to make it as painless and easy as possible for clinicians who are interested in adopting these to try that out within their particular environment. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to Matt, um, who's going to take you through some of the real world kind of use cases. Some, um, and then Matt, if you could hand over to Joe just when you're done. Um, Shall do. Thanks, everyone. I'm just going to... Like a charm. Great. Okay. So uh, my name is Matt. Uh, I am the engagement manager for the AI Center. Um, we are a consortium of uh, NHS trusts and universities. Uh, we used to be called the London AI Center, but we kind of expanded out from London. Um, and yeah, so we can partner with Arts Digital to develop this product. Um, we are based out of Guys in St. Thomas's NHS Trust, which is the kind of the one over the river from the Houses of Parliament. Um, and I'm going to be talking, I'm not in the camera shot, 
now I am. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm going to be talking about some of the uh, apps that we can now deploy on aid. Um, and I think I would start a little bit by kind of stressing the point that Michael kind of finished on there, which is that um, deploying AI solutions into NHS trusts takes a very long time currently uh, because you need kind of committed hardware, you need infrastructure people to be able to get uh, everything connected, uh, you need to connect stuff to systems uh, like PACS, which is the image database of the hospital, and all of this takes time. Um, and it also takes uh, a lot of people. And one thing the NHS uh, can sometimes struggle with is having the right people with availability and technical know-how kind of at the right place at the right time. Um, there's issues with uh, the numbers of radiologists and radiographers able to kind of analyze images. Uh, but there's kind of an even bigger issue with the IT support infrastructure that can support the radiologists and radiographers. Uh, a common problem that is happening in the AI for healthcare space, especially with university startups um, or spin outs, is that a team will spin out from a university. They will have um, 18 months of runway to kind of get their company on its feet um, and they will run out of money before they even get into one NHS trust because of the amount of time it takes. Uh, we kind of currently have a bit of an embarrassing issue in the UK that we have a lot of uh, great research being done at universities that then gets commercialized in Italy or the Netherlands or the USA or Canada um, because they can't get their product installed in the hospital. Um, right. Um, this is one of the things that aid is really hopefully going to be able to fix because we have done the hard work of getting into hospitals. So now all you need to do is get installed onto AID and then you can immediately bypass all the hard work that we've had to do. Um, so kind of just verbosely said what I wrote quite shortly on the slides, we enable the rapid deployment of AI models. Um, and a really helpful thing as well is that um, a lot of clinicians know that uh, healthcare technology can look great in uh, principle, um, but you really want to be able to test it in your own uh, hospital setting on real hospital data. Um, uh, so this enables uh, a company to kind of get its AI product into a hospital and get doctors testing it on their own data really quickly. Um, we enable trusts to deploy this technology without needing loads of help from the IT teams and the IG team because we've already worked with them. Um, and then once uh, the clinicians are happy with the product uh, and want to start using it, then these apps will then greatly be able to reduce radiologist time. Um, and the radiologist time is being uh, better spent, then the kind of logical conclusion of that is that patient outcomes are better. Um, so a great example of this is that uh, lung cancer in the UK is evaluated at costing £2.4 billion pounds, um, because of low survival rates. There are loads and loads of AI products that are able to help with this. Um, this has been a thing that people have been looking at for a long time, um, but it takes a long time to get these products installed into hospitals, um, and hopefully uh, we will be able to help with that. Again, Joe's going to give us a demonstration of uh, how easy it is to install Cures uh, QXR um, via aid. Um, so in terms of like uh, what is good for an AI application for healthcare, a slightly corny analogy is that um, these are two aircraft that were designed by European consortia in the 60s and 70s. Um, one of them does something very fancy and technically, one of them does something very reliably and easily. Uh, and one of these planes is the most successful plane ever built, and one of them is now just a museum piece for nerds. Um, so yes, if you want to, if you're kind of interested in designing an AI product that would be really valuable for the NHS, uh, design an Airbus A380, don't design the Concorde. Um, and I can start by giving a case study uh, from kind of the first thing we kind of did in anger with aid at Guys and St. Thomas's Trust. Um, and this is uh, <laughs> confusingly radiotherapy, which is nothing to do with radiology, but they sound very similar. So radiotherapy is a uh, highly effective treatment course uh, for some types of cancer. Um, and the way radiotherapy works is that you uh, take a tumor and you bombard it with radiation and the radiation kills the tumor. Um, the slight issue with radiotherapy is that that radiation can basically kill anything that hits. So you need to make sure it's not going to hit any healthy tissue or minimize the amount of healthy tissue that receives a radiotherapy dose. Uh, so what you do is you take a patient and you give them a CT scan, um, which uh, I'm uh, from the NHS, so I'm going to say lots of acronyms. So a CT scan is uh, kind of an X-ray in 3D. Um, 
and uh, the radi um, radiographer and the radiotherapy team then uh, label by hand all the organs in the body uh, from that CT scan so they can calculate the volume and position of those organs in relation to the tumour. That information then gets fed into an algorithm that uh, calculates the dosage and position of the dosage and then the patient receives radiotherapy. Um, this contouring, which is a process of drawing around all the organs and the uh, areas of interest for the radiotherapy, uh, can take like half an hour, but upwards of like four hours, depending on the complexity of where the tumour is and uh, the type of tumour and the organs around. Um, uh, and accuracy of contouring is very important. Um, and even with the best will in the world, there is a, a human variance in this process. So as well as speeding up this process, AI um, can potentially create greater uniformity in this process, um, resulting in more reliable outcomes from radiotherapy treatment. Uh, so this is an open source AI um, app uh, developed by a team at a university hospital in Basel. Um, the entire uh, app is uh, available to kind of explore and interrogate on GitHub. Um, it's really cool. Uh, what it does is you feed it a, a full body CT and then it segments 104 um, separate parts of the human body. Uh, I will be showing very, very gentle medical images on these slides. If you have any issues, look away. But no, there's no blood, there's no gore. Just, sorry, should have, should have said that before I suddenly showed you the in, inside of someone's body. Um, but yes, <laughs> meant to do that before I did this. Um, but yeah, so it can label bones, it can label um, soft tissue, muscles, lungs, intestines, heart, all the important bits for radiotherapists uh, when they are doing CT scans on patients. Um, so a uh, radiotherapist uh, called George and Tentas at Guys and St. Thomas's uh, I got, got in touch with us via tweeting at Harris, um, who uh, was uh, one of project leads on aid, um, and said, this app seems like this would make my life really easy. Um, and it was very fortuitous because he messaged us just at the time that we had aid up and running in uh, St. Thomas's. And so we were like, great, this sounds like a, a great test case we could do. Uh, so we installed it. And then he has obviously a big batch of radiotherapy data um, with the contours that the team at Bersin St. Thomas's have done. Uh, and then we just uh, ran all of that data through total segment data. So total segment data can segment an entire torso CT, uh, all 104 bits uh, in two minutes, which is obviously substantially faster than a um, radiologist spending four hours manually contouring things. So provided the results were kind of within the realm of human inter, um, intervariance, then this was already going to be a massive game changer. Um, and the answer is, is that it was. Um, basically, just very simply, uh, George had said before we went into the trial that if we've got a dice score, and a dice score is a measure of how much it overlaps uh, between the computer generated version and the human generated version, of around, um, of above 0.7, he would be happy with that. Um, and then for the lungs, esophagus and heart, we were at 0.8. Uh, sorry, for the esophagus and heart, we were at 0.8. And for the lungs, we were at um, fantastic, basically, kind of 0.95. Um, so this team were really happy with this and they're experimenting going forwards. They're kind of working out how this could be incorporated into a workflow. Um, and they're really happy about it. The reason we're really happy is that it went from that initial tweet to Harris to having the full set of results in six weeks. Um, whereas if you wanted to kind of do a custom like bespoke installation of a new piece of software with like accompanying hardware and tying that in with the pack system and with a patient data system, it would take you six weeks to organize the first meeting where you got everyone relevant in the room, um, let alone even beginning to run the study, let alone finishing the study. Um, so in this case, um, I know this is not a CE marked app or an FDA approved app. This is just a research app. So this is not going to be used for a little while anyway before we start using it to influence patient care. Um, but already we're very excited and we're able to kind of uh, show clinicians AI being used in practice which is really exciting. Um, the uh, next uh, kind of way that AI is quite exciting. So this is, uh, these guys are actually gonna be presenting more about this app tomorrow uh, in the talk about Flip, which is the same time, same place. Um, 
Uh, this is an app that uh, is currently being researched on. This, these guys are from King's College London, who are kind of physically co-located with GSTT, which is guys in St. Thomas' and NHS Trust. Um, uh, this is an app that takes a head CT and uh, highlights and volume, um, works out the volumes of a stroke region, which is obviously very helpful. Um, it's very helpful if you uh, have a difficult to identify lesion, if you want to calculate the volume of the lesion, that is a time consuming process, which again can be automated very quickly uh, via AI. Um, and uh, the reason aid is very exciting in this case is because previously researchers, when they're working on models, they get like a big load of test data that is all pre-approved for use. And then they work on that and they're testing their model on the same test data. And then if they then deploy it into a hospital and then it starts working on real world data, they often find like, it's not working as well as they thought, or it does something unpredictable, they can go back to the drawing board. With aid, it's just substantially easier for researchers to start having their models deployed in hospital settings um, so they can start experimenting with it in real world data. Um, aid has approval from the MHRA for uh, non interventional uh, evaluation studies. Uh, that's blanket approval for whatever you want to do with it. So, provided your output from aid is not going to be used in patient care. It has access to patient data if you have a clinician who is willing to do the work for you. So aid already greatly increases the ability for AI researchers in our affiliated um, organizations to kind of start testing around with this stuff. Um, but yeah, if you want to learn more about the Stroke CT app tomorrow, come tomorrow because they're also using the Federated Learning Interoperability Platform. Um, and if you're interested in Federated Learning, they're kind of cool, they're getting it to work. It's quite nice. Um, but that's beyond the scope of this talk. Um, one that we already mentioned um, as a big issue currently in the UK and kind of globally is um, uh, lung cancer um, and yeah, uh, chest x-rays, looking for issues in chest x-rays is looking for differences in shades of grey, um, which is quite hard um, and uh, it's a technically demanding process. Uh, another issue uh, with chest x-rays um, and with human beings in general is that we have something called search complete bias. So if you look at an image, you spot something that's wrong, you think, I've spotted the thing that's wrong. And patients famously can have many things wrong with them concurrently. Um, so AIs, although famously AIs have many biases, one of the things, a one of the biases AIs can successfully avoid is search complete bias. So an AI, if it analyzes an image, will find everything wrong with the image. Um, another really useful thing for this sort of AI application in a clinical setting, uh, especially when we're talking about time constraints on radiologist time, is that an AI can very confidently say, there's nothing wrong with this X-ray, this X-ray on the hand, you should probably take a look at. And it can really help uh, people work in hospital settings with limited amounts of time, prioritize the images they actually have to analyze. We're not saying that like, this is going to be the only thing that diagnoses you. We obviously want an expert radiologist uh, radiologist with like many years in understanding the subtleties of these images to like write the report, give the sign off, have a full understanding, and explain that to your um, oncologist or GP. Um, but these apps can take a massive chunk out of that first step of prioritizing their time. Uh, this is now available to install on AID, which we're very excited about. And we're going to show you in a little minute how easy it is to install on AID. Is anyone here from the NHS? Lovely. <laughs> Um, the final one I was going to talk through, um, again, is an MSK app. These are very exciting, again, um, from the issue that was referenced right at the top of this presentation about 24-7 uh, care. Um, if you are presenting at a hospital with a broken wrist in the middle of the night um, or a potential fracture, um, and the, the radiologists aren't around, um, it will take a long time for uh, a fracture for a human radi It could potentially take a long time for a human radiologist to detect your fracture and say an emergency uh, emergency medicine doctor working in A&E might not feel confident enough to be able to make the call as to whether or not a fracture in the X-ray is a fracture or not. Um, but this is a uh, thing that these AI models have fairly good at doing. Um, so breakages are reasonably easy to detect. You look for where two bones that should be connected aren't. Oh, sorry, one bone should be one bone. is in fact two bones. Um, that's quite easy to do. But fractures, again, you're looking for subtleties in um, shades of gray or white. Um, 
So an advantage of this is that AI doesn't sleep, so it's able to extend the extend the care through the night. And similar to that long X-ray example as well, um, if you have one person working through the night and they have 100 X-rays to analyze, these AIs can uh, prioritize the ones. So these top 10 probably have a fracture in. You should take a look at these first. And that helps speed up the patient process as well. Um, so the short-term impact of aid um, is that, yeah, we're, there's currently the um, government rollout uh, for artificial intelligence across the NHS. Um, we are hoping to uh, kind of be including some of those grants and have aid be selected as the way of deploying these apps uh, into hospitals. Because um, uh, the reason we think we're, we think we're great for many reasons, um, but one of the things we think great is that we are an AI vendor agnostic solution. Um, so if you install Cure, but you actually instead decide that you want to run with something else, if you've used us to install Cure, you can also use us to install something else. Um, there's many apps doing roughly similar things, and we enable uh, an AI vendor um, agnostic solution. So you're not going to spend ages setting up all the connections and think, well, I don't really like this app so much, but it was such a pain to get this installed. We're going to stick with them anyway. Um, and we accelerate effectively adopting AI at scale because, as I said, we can do MSK stuff for emergency medicine. We can do um, CT segmentation for um, radiology. There's a whole bunch of radiography. So there's a whole bunch of stuff we can do. Um, and kind of in the longer term, so we currently, AIDS only works with DICOM, which is pictures basically, or, um, you know, MRI scans, um, radiology data um in and kind of radiology data back out at the other side um obviously hospitals produce lots more different types of data um there are kind of low-hanging fruit really for next steps for us things like pathology which is you know, microscope slides of cells uh that's reasonably easy to digitize and then you have the digital image which you can analyze with ai and then works roughly similar to the radiology stuff um there's also uh genomics data very um uh kind of requires a lot of um kind of human work which can be automated um and obviously the nhs um produces vast amounts of uh, free text data as well as structured text data which ai is um very good at analyzing and organizing and making useful elements from um so i kind of where the kind of the next steps of the broader horizon for the development of aid would be the ability to handle those sorts of data and run those sorts of apps to help different parts of the hospital, not just radiologists and radiography. And then the longer term vision would be uh, it incorporates FLIP a bit as well, but if so, it's kind of having A spread out across many different trusts. Um, and then we have our kind of our partner platform, which allows federated learning for researchers uh, to develop apps, which can then very easily be deployed onto AID, running at regional levels um, in coordination with. Um, uh, academia, and then kind of at a top, higher level above that kind of national R&D infrastructure, which um, leverages the platform that we have installed in the hospitals. So kind of really speed up and streamline the process of researching AI for healthcare and then deploying it into hospitals. I think that's everything from me. So I'll hand over to Joe, and he will show us uh, just how easy this all is. Yeah, <laughs> Yep. Hi everyone, I'm Joe. Um, I've been working with the AI, sorry, not everyone, but probably since the start, probably three years ago, something like that, but I'm one of the originals. Um, but actually, I get asked to do these quite often, do demos, because I've, I've been around probably the longest, but I'm immensely proud of the product, and, but there's guys sat in the room here who, you know, at the back there have done a fantastic job, Lily as well. Um, so I just want to, you know, give them a bit of a light as well, because it's not just a couple of people that made this happen. Um, Mike asked me to put a quick demo together. Obviously, I haven't done a live one. If everyone's done a live demo, you will go wrong. So I've actually recorded it. Um, and I wanted to, obviously, it's quite a big platform. We've got the publishing hub. So that's where the, uh, the app developers log on and they push their images and, you know, uh, add all the documentation around clinical safety. I didn't want to show that because uh, it's quite boring. I wanted to show the actual stuff around I guess how the clinicians would use it and how uh, it'd be used in a trust. So when you talk through, I guess, four stages, really, that um, clinicians generally go through to actually get AI into a trust. 
uh, you know, they need to install the application. And, you know, Matt's talked about how difficult that is. Hopefully I'll show you uh, how easy it is with an aid. Need to execute. Um, so I'll show you how easy it is to send data to aid and um, getting actually uh, results back out of it. And then the validation. So like Matt said, you know, generally there's loads of AI vendors that all roughly do the same thing and say, you know, competing apps and how do clinicians actually choose the right app for them. Uh, a lot of AI vendors are quite cagey about the data they've trained on as well. So when you're saying, yes, I've got to sign up for this, you know, they may give you a free trial, may trial it out. But actually, like Matt said, once you've got that point to point integration, which most of them do, and you've got that custom hardware and the IT have onboarded them, actually getting it out is probably not as easy as you think. Um, whereas AD is sort of plug and play, and you're able to swap apps in and out as you feel. And the final thing is the clinical use. So actually, sort of the, the sort of end goal is that the clinicians never even have to deal with it. They send data or it auto gets forwarded on from the modalities or from a pack system and they just get the results back and they actually don't need to interact with it at all. So I'll just go on to the first one, which is the installation. I was gonna um, hopefully make that bigger. Is it big? Yeah. So you can see here, this is the sort of the live um, app store. You can sort of filter by um, speciality. You can search as well. You can sort. I'm just going to install this Cure app, which is um, if anyone's, pause it, if anyone's sort of working at the moment within um, healthcare, obviously, Matt mentioned the 21 million fund. Uh, Chess CT is massive at the moment. Now, you know, that's what they're really focusing on. Um, and what, like Matt said, it's, it's all about. You know, people come in and they may come in for um, a, chest, a chest scan because they may have pneumonia or something. But actually, if you put it through the Cure app, you may find early cancer nodules and things like that. And that's where the sort of real value is. It's around incidental findings. Good play. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to install this so you can see here that as a clinician, as, a, as an aid admin, as a clinical safety officer, I would be able to come in here and there's, obviously this is just test data, but you'd have um, a, a raft of information so you can make the right decision for your trust. And it's on a per trust basis as well. Um, you can see I'm just gonna click a deploy button. Uh, it's telling me there's a new version out, but, and that's literally it. At that point, click of a button and that's the actual application installed within a trust. You know, Matt went on about, you know, it takes them weeks and weeks to do. Once your app's on to aid, it's a click of a button. And this scales out. So every trust that has aid has access to that cure app. So it's not, you know, Matt mentioned around, you know, taking weeks and weeks, but that's per site as well. So these point to point integrations just don't scale very well or don't scale at all, really. Um, skip. Go to the next one. Michael, you need a proper trackpad. Um, right, I'm just going to show you the execution now as well. Okay, so you can see here what we've got is clinical workflows. So I've set one up before. This is where Michael you know, mentioned about these building blocks of pipelines of data that come through your, your trust. Uh, I'm not going to show you one that's quite, quite boring, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but we are creating a nice sort of uh, UI, which is drag and drop and move boxes to make it a little bit more interactive. Uh, so I'm just going to go into this patient. This is on, um, let's pause it, on uh, what we call Orthanc, which is uh, our test pack system. Now, obviously, some trusts will be using GE, they'll be using Section, they'll be using Philips. It's up to them, but actually, DICOM is so well sort of defined. They all work the same way, roughly. So we've got uh, experience integrating with GE and Sectra. And we haven't found any difference, to be perfectly honest. Um, and you shouldn't do because they're all built on that DICOM standard. So I'm just going to show you here that it is a chest x-ray. I'm not sort of lying about it. Um, again, um, there's not much to see. If I was a clinician looking, obviously, I don't know what I'm really looking at. It just, just a chest x-ray. Um, and this is me sending data to Aid. Now, I've manually pushed that. But like I say, this could be hooked up to scanners. It could be hooked up um, through rules. And you can see here straight away, it's come through to the system. So it's, it's real time execution. It's not, you know, batch executions. It, it's, it's taking these, you know, someone coming for, for a chest x-ray, 
it's gone into packs uh, near real time and then straight into Word. And that's how you get these um, results back out of it. So I'm just going to get part of it and go to the next slide. And the final thing, well, not second to, sorry. Wait a minute. So you've got this value, Michael, I'm going to get you a new laptop. So we've got this uh, validation stage. So the clinicians always need to validate what, what, what the actual output is. Uh, within A, we allow them to do that within the platform itself. So I'm just going to show you here now, we've got this clinical review page. So it's another sort of task type. And all the output of the, um, the input studies come through, as well as the report from, from the actual uh, AI application as well. So the clinician can come into here in their own time. It's all part of a clinical research study and can validate and either reject it and give a reason why they're rejecting it, basically saying they don't agree with the, with the diagnoses. Or they alternatively can um, accept it and say, yes, I, I agree. The, the, the reason why this is so powerful is they can run these real time clinical trials against their data. And we aggregate all these stats so they can then write up their own reports from, from the actual platform. Um, and then the final thing I was going to say is the real value is it is an application in clinical use. So once they've validated, yes, this application says that it does what it's supposed to do, it works on our data, let's sign it off, let's, let's agree commercials, let, let's actually use it. The, the clinicians don't have to interact with Ed at all. They will see data going in again, but actually the, the outputs go directly to PACS and that's your encapsulated PDF, your overlays and your SR reports as well, your structure reports. Um, and that just, like, like Matt says, just allows us, um, you know, to go straight out and help the, help the actual patients themselves. The next thing we're doing is like say the HL7, prioritization so for instance this person would have an overlay there'd be a hl7 message generated and it would may push this person to the top of the list and tell the clinician you know you really need to look at this and that's it hopefully <laughs>